Okay. If in doubt, open the desk. Well, thank you for the invitation. I wonder what I can manage now in, in nine minutes or so. Okay, well, as uh, Gardner said, I've spent a, a long time, 28 years in the oil industry, before being tempted to drop my salary enormously and, and go up to uh, Durham University and take up this chair in uh, geoenergy, carbon capture and storage. And it's been extremely, it remains delightful to be able to work with some of the brightest people in the, I've ever had the opportunity to come across. And because of my old uh, connections with industry, make reinforce those connections, and I think we're really uh, uh, developing things quite nicely. So in terms of what we've been doing, or what has been happening in the UK in terms of uh, uh, CCS, I'd like to look at just two components. Capacity, injectivity, and and integrity in, in one set, if you will, and then move on. Having come out of the oil industry, um, I'm mightily impressed, and Gardner touched on it, on the opportunity set which exists uh, for enhanced oil recovery in the UK using carbon dioxide. And I think, and I think it's clear from what Gardner said as well, uh, many people are thinking the same way, that it has the potential to provide a soft start for true carbon storage if we can earn revenue from producing some oil. So we'll take a look at what the, the opportunity set is there. <coughs> now in terms of the North Sea, we have a fantastic knowledge base, uh, really second only to none in, uh, globally. We have, for example, as many people here will know, near th complete 3D seismic coverage of licensed areas. Even outside of that, we've got extensive 2D. There are over 10,000 wells. This is from the, the DEC database. 10,000 wells or so which have been drilled on the UKCS. In fact, it's rather more than that because DEC tends to, every well, it tends to count slots rather than wells. So when you look at uh, recompletions and so on in fields, it's many more than that. And something in excess of 350 fields. Sure, some have got just one well or, or so, but many, like the big old ones, have got hundreds of wells. So not only do we have uh, brilliant static data, and this province is fairly young, of course, 1965, the first well, but also a wealth of dynamic data of critical importance to understanding what might happen to the CO2 when you inject it in the subsurface. <clears throat> Now, just a couple of slides on uh, capacity, injectivity, and, and uh, integrity. There are no real numbers on this because I would be spoiling what's going to be coming soon from ETI, the Energy Technology Institute, set up a joint venture between the government and some of the major industrial partners, BP and Shell, for example. They sponsored, one of the first projects they sponsored some nearly two years ago now, was the storage appraisal project. Uh, I was involved from, I didn't have anything part of the setup, but it was involved from day one of its execution. And it brought together 10 institutes and industry partners from across the UK. Uh, four universities, five uh, industrial companies, and the British Geological Survey. It was a group I never thought could deliver so big, but it's done phenomenal things. It has and you'll see as the results start to emerge from ETI, delivered a step change in methodology for calculating what the capacity might be, a realistic assessment of CO2 storage capacity. Uh, it will be soon, well, it's this um, uh, contract's being awarded at the moment to allow the database to be accessible to all and everyone, which has been created there. But it took it all the way through to investment decisions. It's like many of us would have done in the petroleum industry as a... Um, uh, a yet to find for a basin. It's that kind of report. It's not the detail that you require for individual uh, prospect evaluations, but it provides the basis for the, the whole basin investment. And you'll see at the bottom, um, it's come up with some 600 potential storage sites. Uh, principal amongst these is the work being done on these deep saline formations, deep aquifers, which uh, ultimately will form the largest repository collectively. Uh, much work, uh, of course, has already been done on the individual fields. And it builds on some of the fantastic work which people like Sam Holloway at the BGS did uh, five and six years ago. But it's not all sorted out. 
when you do get to see the results from this, you'll see quite a wide range between the nominally proven case and the potential upside. And a lot of that is the uncertainty is, is within one figure, if you will. And that's the efficiency, if you like, the carbon capture and storage equivalent of petroleum saturation. Now, of course, when we speculate or when we do our prospect evaluation, we think in ranges of maybe at a lower end, if it's going to work, it may fail, of course, but maybe at a lower end of 50% of, uh, oil saturation, up to perhaps, a, in extreme cases, maybe 80% or so. So you've got about nearly a factor between the low end and the high end. When it comes to CCS, there's enormous speculation as to what the efficiency might be, how much of that pore space you can fill. On a basin analysis scale, particularly coming out of the USA, folk have been talking about 1% and 2%. And yet we know, and we'll come back to this from an EOR point of view, you might be able to put 40 or 50% in there. You're talking about orders of magnitude rather than factors. So a big range in the outcomes. And that's one of the things which uh, really we need to move on to in terms of putting it into practice, that's the sort of thing which will be sorted out by injecting CO2 into the ground. But until that time, well, let's be before we get there, mention just integrity briefly and then move back on to the, uh, the other piece about injecting CO2 in the ground. Integrity of these sites is, is preeminent in terms of whether or not we're going to be able to uh, convince the general public, convince governments to be able to put CO2 in the ground. I see Bill Senior in, in the audience. Bill's been working a great deal on, on um, uh, the potential, using old oil industry data to look at the potential for leakage. But we need to do much more. And this is about halfway through the talks. It's the advert, if you will. Three topics which we're doing here in Durham, or there in Durham. We're looking at the integrity of fault systems. Will they move or be lubricated, crestal faults, for example, in potential storage sites? We've also installed some new instrumentation which allows us to uh, look at the inter fluid rock interaction. If you inject thousands of pore volumes of CO2 through your well and into the near wellbore region, how is it going to react with those wellbore materials, the cements, the steels and the adjacent uh, uh, rocks? We can do that at reservoir temperatures and pressures and collect the effluent and, and see what's been dissolved or perhaps precipitated. The other thing we're going to need to do, and at the moment, the storage sites which have been developed globally, <clears throat> monitoring one of the key tools, of course, is 4D seismic. We look at what the image of the CO2 looks like in the subsurface today, and then in a year's time, and what's happened in Sleipner, which is the biggest project in Europe, is a 4D survey has been shot every year for the past little over a decade or so. <coughs> Blimey. Once you multiply by, by the number of times we're going to have to um, uh, choose individual sites, maybe not on an annual basis, you've got an enormous bill. The other thing, of course, is it's episodic. So what we're again looking at, and this is really weird, is the potential to use uh, subatomic particles generated in the upper atmosphere caused by uh, uh, supernova uh, millions of light years away. They cascade down high energy particles and penetrate the Earth and are selectively absorbed by uh, density thickness. It's a bit wild, chance of success is a bit remote, but it's certainly worth looking at because it will give you a 24-7, potentially light, low cost method of doing that. And all of these and many other research programs which are going on around the country and indeed around the globe do fit rather nicely with the documentation, AGPTF, the, the uh, advanced um, power generation uh, equivalent to the CCSA, have put together a delightful, thorough uh, documentation on what R&D is required to take uh, CO, CCS through to um, execution at an industrial scale, and we're addressing some of those figures there. But moving back to that issue of um, putting CO2 in the ground and uncertainty as to how much you might get in there, you often hear speculation, are we going to have to build something the size of, and I choose 40s as, the first major field that was developed in the North Sea. Is it, is it that kind of game again? Uh, and then people start to have rather sinking feelings as to whether or not we have the financial capacity to do that. Maybe not. Maybe not. What have we done before that might be elements of this? So it's perhaps not as such an enormous uh, uh, game 
to simply go straight into CCS. Well, let's look at the EOR potential in the North Sea, for example. It's a well-proven tool in West Texas, where there are about 100 fields which have been subject to CO2 EOR. The CO2 is not anthropogenic for the most part. It's shipped down from natural accumulations in Wyoming and elsewhere. A couple of thousand kilometres in pipelines as high density phase and injected into these oil fields, most of which are shallow, cold and pretty poor quality, to be honest. And over the past 30 years, the Texans reckon they've produced an extra billion barrels or so of oil. What could we do in the UK? Well, if you take the low end of their observations and apply it to the UK, maybe as an extra 5% additional recovery of stoic, you'll have much better reservoir conditions, more of it will be missable, which means a better sweep uh, efficiency. You may get around 3 billion barrels from the North Sea. That could be rather good for the Exchequer, let's say. And interestingly, if you take just the CO2 industrial production from Scotland, the northeast, and the northern half of Yorkshire, you have about the right volume over a 20-year period. You're producing about a billion tonnes of CO2 over that 20-year period, just about right for winning that three billion barrels of oil. So potentially quite interesting. And the other thing to think about is when... People say, ah, but it's not economic, we can't get it going. What have we done before? And I'll take three examples, and I love the alliteration, Morecambe, Magnus, and Miller. So if we look at Morecambe, particularly North Morecambe, for the past two decades or so, it's pr been producing a gas which is about 6% CO2. It's the biggest project in Britain which strips out CO2 from that gas stream, because otherwise it would be under spec. And it's been doing that, and it's a much bigger programme than any of the pilot schemes which have been postulated and fallen by the wayside like Lungannet. So we can do it. We can take that out of the gas stream. At the moment, it goes up there. One day, it might go down there. The next system to look at is Magnus. Now, Magnus, uh, the decision was taken by BP and John Brown around about the turn of the century, driven, I believe, largely from uh, belief that Al Gore would be in the White House and uh, there'd be much more stringent um, environmental controls, and they chose to do something quite spectacular. They built a gas pipeline from Shehalian, west of Shetlands, where they couldn't use the gas, all the way to Sullenvo, and then another 200 kilometres out to, to Magnus, and began to inject methane into their reservoir rather than um, simply water. It's been phenomenally successful. When the early papers were produced um, by... Um, Alan McGregor and others a few years ago, they reckoned perhaps it would add 50 million barrels or so to Magnus Reserves. But it seems to be coming out rather better than that. They're getting something like five barrels of, ev five barrels of extra oil from the field for every tonne of C me methane injected. And CO2 is a much better um, agent for EOR. It reaches parts of the reservoir that other gases don't reach, to borrow from an old Heineken advert. And the third area which we ought to look at is Miller. Miller is a very, Miller and all the Bray system are very acidic crudes. The Miller gas stream has 15% uh, or so CO2 in. Miller's now abandoned as it happens. These fields were, before they were oil fields, CO2 accumulations. But the point is that all the, the hardware in these fields is engineered for acidic crudes. So we have, all the way back to shore in Peterhead, the pipeline system which can take, potentially take, the CO2 with much less uh, re-engineering than might be required elsewhere. Now clearly BP did their best to put a programme together, uh, and I, if, I don't understand all the ins and outs of why, quite why it failed, but one of the issues was the economics of it. Now, it's worth taking another leaf out of um, the... Uh, the Texan handbook, if you will, because in the 1970s, when that EOR first started in Texas, the Texas Railroad Commission, the equivalent of our uh, Inland Revenue, uh, decided that they would halve the tax take, I think to something ridiculous like $2 a barrel, slightly different from our own, but that was enough stimulus to get it going. And the, the revenue which then 
accrued to the uh, Railroad Commission was substantially greater than that which would have occurred if they hadn't made that kind of decision. So perhaps we do need a little leverage here. Now for me, now clearly putting one molecule of CO2 in and pulling one molecule of oil out is not quite true uh, mitigation of emissions. It's better than sending it all up in the atmosphere, but it's not true storage. But I reckon if you begin to understand how to inject CO2 into the reservoirs, I mean, there's speculation at the moment that we'd have to co-produce brine, which would as be a, almost as big a headache anyway. If we can understand how it works when there's a revenue stream from EOR uh, over a 15 to 20 year period, we'll do a number of things. We'll have an industry which is good at it. We'll understand the subsurface dynamics of CO2 injection and retention and efficiency and so on. We can move from EUR seamlessly into true storage, even within the same pools. And we'll end up with a workforce and a technology uh, array which knows how to do it, something we could export. And because we've got revenue, it will pay for those monitoring, measurement and, v and validation processes, which we're going to have to do on the cheap if it's pure storage, pure waste disposal. Anyway, finally, when? Well, we need to do it now. Our infrastructure is declining. It will continue to decline. This is a slightly old slide, and things are lasting a little bit longer, but the infrastructure is declining. The blue shape you see there is a 20-kilometre halo around the fields. As we, more fields come offline, the chances of doing this diminish. So let's get on with it. Thank you. So to get the most out of today, we would like to <clears throat> do some questions and answers and have a bit of discussion. So, if, if oh, I, I thought yeah. we were doing a and then. Yeah, no, no, if okay. you stay here. Um, I'll stay here. Any questions? Would you like to start with some questions for John? <coughs> if, if not, why don't I kick off? I mean, <clears throat> I talked about testing times, and uh, you, know, you could say that we're somewhat <coughs> stuck at the moment. We're on the threshold of doing projects, but not getting quite there. And you're told us we can start now. So what do you think? What's the one thing you think uh, government, industry, or indeed academia can do to really start pushing over the thresholds and get things started? <clears throat> well, I think the thing that occurs to me in conversation with parts of government is this dilemma between CO2 being a waste product and CO2, as we, we will talk about today, being a potential commodity. And knowing how to handle it as both of those things is, I think, one of the things we need to solve as a country. Uh, and at the moment, much of government is maybe beginning to change, but the conversations I've had over the past two years uh, suggesting it might be useful, either as a feedstock for petrochemicals or as a, an agent for EUR, causes all sorts of angst. Uh, how do we deal with it is, is the general question back. And I think this comes back to a number of times I've had conversations with folk which have gone something along the lines of, well, we can do CCS, but we can't do EUR because it's uneconomic. And you think, hang on, that doesn't. However, you know, if, if you level the playing field, or even uh, it, it approach leveling the playing field, that clearly doesn't make sense. If we can produce something which has intrinsic value, it should work. And I think it's that decoupling which is uh, is important. Okay, great. So we are going to come back to this. So we are going to have a, 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 t a little session at the end here. But I can take one more question and then we'll move on. Just a quick one, Michael Priestnell. I was just wondering, how, how high does the oil price have to be, if, if that's if there's an answer to that question, for EOR to become economic on, it, on its own terms in the North Sea? And, and is there an issue that that money, even if it weren't were economic, that money would be spent on something else because it's worth... Well, it might be, and, and I can possibly give you a figure, but I know where I got my figure from, and I'm looking to David Hanstock, who can probably better answer that in terms of... Uh, someone who's actively within a project. You don't mind, do you, David? Current oil prices ought to be able to support enhanced oil recovery. If, if you have CO2 in the province. Mm. That's encouraging. <laughs> great. Well, well, we'll come back to that. Again, let's thank John for a great presentation. Thank you. So I'd like to move on to our second presentation.